Thank you, thank you very much. Hello and welcome to a conversation with Dr. Jamie Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman is an incredible woman, but you're gonna find that out for yourself in just a few minutes. Dr. Kaufman has one of those jobs that is here at Cook Children's where um, you know that it's an important job and it's one that you probably could never imagine yourself doing ever. She is a child abuse pediatrician. So medically, she investigates child abuse. Um, on top of that, she's the medical director for our CARE team, and CARE stands for Child Advocacy Resources and Evaluation. She loves her job, but there is an aspect of her job that she loves more than anything, probably, I think, um, because she is the primary handler for one of our golden retriever therapy dogs, Kitty. And everybody loves Kitty. So welcome, welcome. We are so happy that you're here. And with her presentation, Good Grief, please welcome Dr. Jamie Kaufman. Thank you for that warm welcome. I wanted to talk today about something that is, is difficult for most of us. The recent media coverage of Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain's suicides made me think about grief and loss all over again. What could we say to Kate's 13-year-old daughter, Anthony's 11-year-old daughter, their other family members and friends that could possibly make them feel better? What could we say? that could comfort them in their morning. As a child abuse pediatrician, every day I see people who are suffering from loss. Loss of a loved one, loss of a relationship, loss of a dream. But all of us have either faced or will face loss and the grief that comes with that. So that means that all of us are faced with what do we do when confronted with somebody who is suffering and grieving. How do we comfort them? In my experience, there are a third of the people that are helpful. And about a third are neither helpful nor, nor hurtful. And about a third actually are hurtful without meaning to, but they are. So how do we first and foremost do no harm? How do we not get in that hurtful group? My response to that is just be. Just sit with them in the midst of their sorrow. You can't undo what happened. You can't turn back time. You can't undo their pain. The only way to the other side of grief is to go through it. There's no way around it. For those of us that are fixers, that makes it really hard because we want to give advice. We want to put a Band-Aid on it. We want to make it all better. But it's not our journey. We can't tell someone grieving what path they need to take to survive the trauma of loss. So what do we do? First, we acknowledge their pain and just how awful it is and that we are so sorry sit with them in silence, let them share whatever they wanna share. There is no right or wrong way to grieve. But I will tell you that there are absolutely right and wrong ways to respond. People will make insensitive comments not meaning to, and those comments can even be in the name of God and religion. Some of those hurtful comments are things like, everything happens for a reason. God will never give you more than you can endure. If you have enough faith, God will heal you. Or aren't you afraid since they committed suicide, they're going to hell? It's in the Bible. People who have lost a loved one, especially to something traumatic like murder, suicide, accidents, they are trying to make sense of something that feels so senseless. 
Comments like that trivialize their pain and add judgment where none is needed. So what do you do? You say the three most powerful words. I am sorry. Acknowledge that you can't really understand totally the pain that they're going through, but you are there to listen when they need to share something. There is no normal way to grieve. There is only their way. So it's normal to be numb. It's normal to be sad and in despair. It's normal to feel like you're going a little crazy and forgetting everything. It's normal to be so angry and have no idea where to gear and direct that anger. It's all normal. But some of us are not really good with sitting in the midst of sorrow. And so to that I say, do the Southern thing. One of my favorite movies. (laughs) Bring a casserole. (laughs) Food and sharing food can be sharing love, right? I mean, we... That's the way we do it. And also those that are grieving and mourning don't have the energy to do those activities of daily life like cooking that is so mundane. They don't feel like it. They may even forget to eat. So you can be there to remind them to eat, remind them to rest and sleep, and remind them to... Just breathe. Sometimes you feel like you just can't breathe. So remind them of those things. Also, when you're with them, don't be afraid to say the name of the one who died. Do you think they've forgotten the name? No. Say the name. Share the good memories. Tell the funny stories. There can be some healing through that. When a parent has lost a child, one of the most fearful things about it is my child will be forgotten. Their name will be forgotten. It will be lost. So say their name. Say the memories. Keep them alive in that way. Also know that you're in it for the long haul. There is no time frame in which grieving should end. There is no time that it just stops. In fact, I would say we never stop grieving. It doesn't end. But that doesn't mean you can't find your new normal and accept the reality of what's happened. So you can help them through that. Remember that six months down the road when there is some trigger out of the blue that causes a grief response? You're there. On all the anniversaries of the death, you're there. For the holidays, you're there. Those are tough times for anybody who's lost a loved one. So you're there for the long haul. But also know that sometimes people get stuck in grief. Now, while there is no time frame that's normal, that if at six months to a year after the loss, they have not been able to move forward, they are still preoccupied with the loss, having intrusive thoughts, and they are making no progress, they may need professional help. And it may be up to you to help them with that. Just getting out of bed takes energy. So... Going and making it to an appointment may be really, really hard. You may need to hold their hand to help them through that process. Just know that even though you can't tell them the path they need to take, you can definitely walk beside them through their journey. Thank you. Dr. Kaufman, thank you so much for that uh, information that you gave us. You gave us great information for the person who's going through the grief and the person who has to deal with the person going through the grief. The griever and the grievee. Correct. Yes. Um, You were very definitive with some of the things that you said. Tell me how you know 
so much about grief and going through it? Well, um, I'm a member of the club, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, my son uh, committed suicide almost eight years ago, three weeks shy of his 20th birthday. And um, so I experienced all those things. And what did you notice about people when they were coming to you after the loss of your child? And because it was a loss in this manner, right, right. it had to be something that was difficult for them and you, but what did you notice about people? Th those that were closest to me and to him were very comfortable. Um, and they're the ones that were in that third, mm -hmm. right? Um, it was very obvious when people were uncomfortable. And I learned very quickly I didn't have time for them. It, it was hurtful to me because he was my, or is my son and I loved him and love him still. And for somebody to be unsure how to even talk about him, that's why I always talk about share the good times. We laugh about the stories about him because that keeps him with us. Mm -hmm. um, and especially being suicide, the people that were uncomfortable, I think, were those that were more judgmental um, and didn't know how to respond. And so it, it made it worse, not mm -hmm. better. You, you talked about just going there and be. Yes. Explain what that means. How do you just go and be? It, it is difficult for some, but really what it means is that person is feeling intense pain. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing you can say is going to make it better. Nothing. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't share some of the burden. And that means you just sit there and listen um, and know that there's nothing you can say. That's why I think the three words, I am sorry, are so powerful. Because all that means is, I am sorry you're going through it. I can't do anything about it, but I feel you. And that, that is, that's helpful. Um, some of the most profound times for me were with my husband or my mother, and I would just sit there and cry and it was really just the hugs, the pat on the back. I would be just, you know, the what ifs and all those things going on. And they were honest, though. I mean, they were like, you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. And that's appropriate because nobody knows. Um, but it was comforting to know that they were feeling my pain as well. How does suicide leave the loved ones? Because that's different. It it's not like a car accident. It's something deliberate. How does it leave the loved ones? Well, however you lose a loved one, there are some things in common. Um, I learned uh, through talking to others that everybody does the what ifs when they lose a child, whether it's from something medical or something mm -hmm. traumatic. But one of the, it was a graffiti in Austin actually that I thought really um, spelled it out and it was suicide transfers the pain from one that died to those that survive. Mm. And so it is a transfer of the pain. Mm. Um, but you know they're not feeling pain anymore, but, but you do. Mm. And I think maybe especially with suicide, I think the guilt is obviously profound in learning how to get some perspective on that and accept what's real and not real. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's a lot of what we do is it's not real. Mm. and. Um, and take one day at a time. I know when he first died, it was so painful. And I was like, how can I survive the next 30 years? Because with my genetics, <laughs> my family lives a really long, long time. time. <laughs> and odds were it was going to be at least 30 years. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, how do I survive that? And the answer is day by day. Mm. So I would wake up every morning and be another day down. And so pretty soon, then those days keep going, and then the months go, and the years go, and the pain gets spread out and becomes bearable, mm -hmm. and um, it changes you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think profound loss, I mean, I feel like I was changed down to the cellular level. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it can do anything but change you. Right. Well, then how do you come back from that 
to the kind of job you have, where you're dealing with people, as you said, who are dealing with loss mm -hmm. and the loss of relationships, dreams, all kinds of things. Right. How do you? How did you face that in 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 that situation? Right. Well, obviously, initially, it was more difficult. Um, I have to say, the first patient that died uh, after coming back to work was, was difficult. Um, to respond appropriately to the parent because again, it's their journey, their path, it's not mm -hmm. mine. Mm -hmm. And so being there for them and mindful of what their needs are and then later addressing mine mm -hmm. um, because it does trigger things, especially early on. Um, but dealing with that afterwards, um, not in the moment. My staff protected me from many things, mm -hmm. especially the first year. Um, from things that they thought would bother me. Um, you know, we do fatality review and there's suicides on that and thing. And so, you know, the first year I didn't go to those. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to hear about other suicides. Yeah. And so they protected me. Um, but I think really I knew that my son was very proud of the work I did. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was really coming back to work and um, helping people, knowing what they're going through and feeling like I'm doing a better job at it was really a way to honor him as well. Okay. And you're saying to other people, please, if you can't, if you're not comfortable, bring a casserole. I I'm telling that. you. I love that. I love casseroles. <laughs> I love cobbler. Um, so, you know, and really, you don't feel like cooking. I mean, eating is that's not on the top of your agenda. Mm -hmm. And I really did have to have people remind me to eat, mm -hmm. remind me to rest, because your brain's going a hundred different places mm -hmm. and, and you just forget. Did you go, did you do therapy at all? Yes, I did. I did um, some grief therapy uh, through our EAP program. Mm -hmm. um, and then also our family uh, went to the warm place and did support groups. My daughter uh, was 13 when he died, so it's a really tough age. That's why the whole Kate Spade thing with the 13-year-old kind of hit home. Um, she, teenagers don't know how to respond to death, mm -hmm. right? And um, she really needed people to talk to. And then they have support groups for the parents, and it's specific to losing your child or the sibling, you know, group losing a brother or sister. So having people that were in a similar journey, um, and we started out, every support group was saying their name. We'd go around and each would say their name because that really is powerful. Mm -hmm. Making sure that they're not forgotten. Exactly. And that they still are loved right. and people care about them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for the tips. They were so wonderful. It, it was great for people who are going through and those who want to walk through the journey with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.